I'm reading from Luke chapter 24, verse 13. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communication are these that you have one to another as you walk and are sad? Permit me to read that verse again, please, verse 17. And Jesus said unto them, What manner of communications are these that you have one with another as you walk and are sad? While reading this portion of Scripture just the other day, these thoughts just seemed to leap out from this text as I'd never seen them before. I don't think I'd ever use this as a text for a message. I'm familiar with it. I've known it for years and years that he came to commune with the disciples often referred to as the Emmaus disciples. I knew these words, but I really didn't know the content. And this is the way the Holy Spirit works for those of us who are most familiar with the Word of God. Suddenly there's revealed deep and marvelous truths that we had not seen or considered before. Here are two men that had traveled with Jesus. They'd heard much about him. No doubt they had seen the blind have their sight restored, the lame to walk, and the deaf to hear, and the hungry fed. They'd seen the multitudes gathered around his ministry. And in those days, uh, with the sparse population, you'd have to say that it had a tremendous success. They had witnessed all of that, and no doubt they had seen, of course, that terrible trial yonder in Jerusalem. And they had watched him die upon the cross, perhaps, and now... Events had piled upon each other, and it seemed that things had not gone right at all for them. And they were sad as they walked. Apparently, they must have been going away from that that had been uppermost in their heart and life up until now. It would seem that this day was, was characterized by fear. They had, uh, they had been very secretive about the whole matter. In fact, while he was dying upon the cross... Most of the disciples had fled, and Jesus died alone. And apparently these two were among the number that had fled from that place called the Skull or Golgotha. I guess fear of the wrong kind can be very detrimental. There's one kind of fear that is most helpful. There's another kind of fear that can be most detrimental to a person, in fact, just ruin them. The fear of man, the book said, bringeth a snare. And these disciples evidently had feared man. I find that this is true uh, to a great extent among pastors over the country. They fear. I know when I first started pastoring, I had fear about, I didn't ever want to hurt anybody's feelings. I didn't want anyone to become angry at me. I didn't want anyone to have ill will toward me. I was so sensitive to those things. In fact, I think that it may have affected my preaching to some extent. And people would say, well, I'd come to your church, but you'd talk to people. And I've considered never having personal work done. And many preachers will do that because they're afraid they'll offend someone. And there'll be pressure on this side and pressure on that side. And the first thing you know, you find yourself just fleeing. I don't know whether I've outgrown that. I think that the greatest fear I might have today would be that of someone doing damage and hurt to our landmark temple. It doesn't make a great deal of difference what man will do to me. I know when we were building this building, I had some fellows to come out here. Well, I didn't call them out. They came on their own, standing just back of this building here, just a few feet. One of those men cursed and said, we're going to ruin you. Well, you know... That's pretty strong language. We're going to make a spectacle of you and your church. You know what I told that fellow? I said, well, you go ahead if you think you can. Maybe I'm ruined already as far as you're concerned. You go ahead and shoot your biggest gun. 
going to ruin you. You know, men will tell you that. And I suppose that there's an element of fear in the hearts of most every one of us. A great general said during World War II, said all sensible men are afraid. But sensible men who are afraid have enough courage to go ahead and defy their fear. And young men going to battle, they're nervous and tense and fearful. And yet many of them have given their lives on the battlefields of the world in the years since this country has been a nation. And they're still doing it. Well, these disciples had fear in their heart because everything that they had built their hopes upon had been destroyed. I don't know whether you fear or not. Some of you people listening to me no doubt would be saved if you wasn't afraid of what somebody would say. Someone would criticize. Someone would find fault with you. If it were not for that, you'd be a Christian. You'd be saved. You've heard Christians mocked and laughed at and, and ridiculed, and as a result of that, there's within your heart a fear to face the realities of life and the hereafter. I guess all of us have been through that to some degree. What is it that's keeping you from being saved? If you will check closely, some of you listening to my voice, it's not because you like liquor or gambling. It's not because that you are bound by a certain lust, but it's because you're afraid that someone will laugh and someone will criticize you and someone say, ah, he's a preacher. He's, he goes and got religion down at that landmark temple. And I don't have much stock in that. I'm, I'm not a religious man, you see. And, and that's why some of you fellows stand six foot tall and weigh 200 pounds and you're a coward. Fear has got the better of you. It's, it's whipped you. It's licked you. Now you stop and think of that for a little while. Fear. The wicked flees when no man pursueth, Solomon said. And these disciples, their lives were no doubt, they had their portion of it. They, they were leaving, they were going on to Emmaus. Things had gone against them and so they, they feared what it may be. You take some of you older people. You don't even trust in God like you ought to. You're afraid of your tomorrows. And you're worried about them and you're afraid you'll starve to death or be hungry or this or that or other things. Everybody that I've ever met to, one, uh, to some degree has fear in their heart. And some of it is not very, it, it's the wrong kind of fear. If you're an aged person and you're afraid, I think that's one thing I admire about old crippled Walter. As far as I've been able to detect that he's crippled and you know, and poor and, and in ill health, but he's, he's not afraid to face the future. Not afraid. And you people that are older, senior citizens, God help you not to be afraid. God help you not to be afraid. David said, I was once young and I'm old now. But I've watched and God has always taken care of his children and I've never seen them begging bread. That's what he said. He said, I've never seen them bra- begging bread. Sometimes people write to me and say, well, I'm hungry, or they say this or that. and say, well, are you a Christian? I've had many to say, well, I was one time, but not now. I say, wait a minute, wait a minute. You always find there's something. Now, we may not have our wants supplied, but God promised to supply our needs. Godliness with contentment is great gain. And I think America, if, you, if I had the time, would take an hour... To go into it. But over this country today, in politics, government, religion, education, in the social realm, every time you read from, from the pen of some uh, minister quoted in the newspaper and etc. and etc., you find that they're expressing fear and fear and fear. Well, brother, without oversimplification, I've got, I have a cure for the ills of our generation. And that's the life that Jesus Christ can give. That'll cure any ill that man may be encumbered with. He promised that he would be with us always, even unto the end of the age. And I have many personal needs, and my Jesus is able to supply those needs. He'll meet those needs. Our God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. And of course... I imagine if you read the context, you'll realize that these Emmaus disciples, Cleophas and the other one, that they were doubtful about the situation. 
things hadn't worked out and their religious leader had been killed, and so they didn't know what was going to happen. Now, he had warned them, he had forewarned them that he would die, but he'd rise again. Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man would be in the heart of the earth and then would come forth. But yet they had not listened, and they were not mentally and spiritually prepared for the test. And so doubts began to well up within them. And you know, my dear friends, this is a terrible thing to doubt. In fact, the matter, if you look at the other side of the ledge of the book, said, without faith it's impossible to please God. So faith is on one side of the ledge, and doubt is on the other. Doubting? You see what I mean? I talked to a young couple who came forward this morning. I trust they're here tonight. And there seemed to be an element of doubt in this young lady's mind after, uh, after coming forward to commit her life to Jesus Christ. And let me clarify this thing as best I can. Do you realize that salvation is taking God at His Word? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And when it dawns upon you that you can fully and completely Trust God's Word. Some of you men come down and sit with these boys. Come on. Boy, sit down there. I'm doing the talking. You don't need to get up and run around here and talk. All right, now, let me show you this. Let me show you this thought again. They were troubled and they were disturbed and they wondered what would be the outcome. Let's just stop for a moment. Suppose that your religious leader had been killed. They'd taken him out, John, and nailed him to another man's cross, and everything that you'd had high hopes in was now disintegrated, and, and uh, things looked pretty dark. You didn't have anyone to turn to. I have people come to me and say, Pastor, I'm sure glad that uh, I can come to you in my time of trouble. I'm glad that you understand. In my counseling, and I imagine the other ministers here on the staff experience the same thing day after day and week after week. All right, you hear me now. Put yourself in their place. You can sort of get an inkling of what they were troubled about, doubting, wondering what would be the outcome of their religious faith. You know, that's what's wrong with some of you. You heard some preacher say that you could be saved today and lost tomorrow, and you didn't have any better sense than to believe it. You say, well, you ought not to say that on radio. Let me, let me go over it again. You heard somebody say that you could be saved today and then lose your salvation tomorrow, and you didn't have any better sense than to believe it. And yet the Word of God is as plain as the morning sunrise and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. And you go through life doubting, you go through life fearful, you go through life wondering if I smoke a cigarette or put on a red sock on one foot and a black sock on the other, well, I may lose my salvation. Depending on keeping your salvation, though, yet the Word of God said we're kept by the power of God. You say, well, now, Rawlings, you're a Baptist. No, I'm a Christian. I've been saved. I believe the Word of God. The Emmaus disciples did not believe. He told them that He would rise again, and they did not believe it. They were uncertain about it. And that's what's wrong. And it's a sin for you to call God a liar. It's a sin. When God says anything, He means it. When God says this is it, then you better listen and take heed. And these disciples were guilty of the very sin. Oh, fools and slow of heart! Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into His glory? Why can't you get the scales from off your eyes and understand the thus saith the Lord? It's going to be a revelation, brother, when we get to the judgment. And these people who may have found fault with the Word of God, these people that have criticized the Word of God, these people who doubt the Word of God, it's going to be a serious thing in that day, brother and sister. Do you realize that? How about yourself? Do you think Cleophas and the other, other disciple got by with it? Do you think you can get by with it whenever God gives you a plain, absolute, 
Well, I read in the newspaper this weekend where a minister here in Cincinnati indicated in the article, being quoted, I suppose he was quoted accurately, that we had to give up these truths absolute, these absolute truths, and go on to other things. Well, now, his God is not my God, and his Bible is not my Bible, because my God is truth. My God, when he says something, you can believe it. And that's why that the liberal and the modernist is fishing in a dry stream is because he doesn't have an ephod. He doesn't have a Bible. He doesn't have a Savior. He doesn't have salvation. And therefore, he's a blind man grasping for something. Abraham believed God. And it was put down to his account that he was righteous. And we're no better or worse than Abraham. And if Abraham believed God, I too can believe God. And if Abraham looked for a city which hath foundation, whose builder and maker is God, I too can look for a city whose builder and maker is God. And with the reading that Bud in the quartet gave a moment ago, someday in that land where we'll never grow old and where the city of God never fades, I'll see my Savior. And I can say, Lord Jesus, I believed your word. I can trust your word. That, my friends, is the hope of nations and of men and of the individual. And I don't want any so-called minister in wolf in sheep's clothing trying to take away my faith. And when I stand by the bedside of my dying loved ones, I want to be able, like I did when my mother died, to bend over and kiss that pallid brow. I know that someday, bless God, I'd see her beyond this pale of death. So they're not going to take my faith. Worlds may shatter and go to pieces around me. Whole libraries can be written and then be burned and the stars can fall and the mountains melt and the rivers dry up and the seas turn to blood. I'll still trust in the living God because my God is alive and I can trust Him. Oh, fools and slow of heart, not to believe what the prophets told you. How about yourself? Some of you listening to me, you don't have enough religion even to get in the baptistry with the Lord Jesus Christ and be baptized. Forget it. Tell you it's something the way people treat the Lord. Take His day and desecrate it. Take His book and tear it apart. Take His message and give the lie to it. No wonder that God is angry with this generation. No wonder he said, I'll turn the earth upside down. I'll scatter abroad the inhabitants thereof. I'll pour out my wrath upon you. I'll tread the winepress of the wrath of my vengeance against an unholy nation and an unholy people. Furthermore, if you look closely at these disciples, you will notice that in verse 20 they were just defeated, that's all said, the chief priests and rulers delivered our leader, condemned him to death, and have crucified him. They thought that was all of it. I think Simon Peter uses a statement that appeals to my heart perhaps more than any other. You know what Simon Peter said about Jesus? He said, whom having not seen, ye love. I've never seen Jesus, but I love him. You say, how can you do that? Well, he's my pen pal. I fell in love with him when I read in this book where he died for me one day to keep me out of hell. And I've loved him ever since. And I love him tonight because he first loved me and gave himself for me. And someday when I look upon his precious face and I can bow before him in humble reverence and say, Lord Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine, all the follies of earth to thee. I just resigned. I gave them all. To take up the cross and follow thee. No, my friend, listen. I tell you now, the devil will whip you. He'll browbeat you. He'll put doubts and fear in your heart. He'll discourage you. He'll take you down to absolute defeat. I see people all the time. Preachers and Christian workers and folks all over this country. Rendered helpless by the power of the devil. Sometimes it refreshes me. I go back to the book of Matthew. 
and the other gospel that records it, the gospel of Luke. And I go out yonder with Jesus to the Mount of Temptation. And there for forty days and forty nights, I watch him. And then I see the devil come and tempt him. The devil comes to try to break down his will. He said to know you're hungry. If you're the Son of God, turn these stones to bread. You created them, you say? Turn them to bread. That's not enough. He said, see the kingdoms of this world. He said, I'll give them to you if you'll fall down and worship me. Don't you see the, don't you see the power of that suggestion? Trying to force the Son of God to yield to the temptation to exercise his omnipotence and his power. That's how the devil does you. He said, well, I don't see anything wrong with that. Why? Look, everybody else is doing this. Why don't you go ahead and do it? If you don't feel like going to Sunday school and church on Sunday, I wouldn't make a fool of myself. Rawlings, all these after crowds, these preachers, that they don't... Uh, I wouldn't pay too much attention to them because after all, you know, uh, they it's personal. They're preaching for money, you know, and I wouldn't get too worked up about all those things. And the devil comes and talks to some of you like that. And then in the family, within the family circle, there'll be someone in your family who will try to discourage you from being a cross-bearer for the Lord Jesus Christ. A young man is very close to me and whom I love very dearly. Married the, his childhood sweetheart. He struggled and tried to go to school and prepare himself to preach the gospel. And while he was doing that, she, after she got off from work, under the pretense of helping to make a living and go out to a nightclub or go out to a night spot and drink and then come home. And while he was trying to pastor a church, all of that transpired. And finally, she divorced him and took his children and then married another man. Pretty rough, isn't it? You think things will not, you think things will not uh, be rough sometime in your life? The devil's going to try to keep you from serving God. You realize that? He'll put a job in front of you, and I'll tell you what, sometimes it'll be 50 or 100 or 150 dollars a week more than what you're making, but when it is, it'll take you away from a fundamental Bible-believing church and put you off somewhere, keep you away from the house of God. And son, you can't, you cannot do that. Somebody says, do you believe working seven days a week? I'll tell you what, I've yet to meet the first man that ever made anything but working like that. Because God said one day is a day of rest. You need recuperation. You need to go and worship. You need to meet God somewhere. You may have to do it. You may have to do it because the business demands it for a time. But if you pursue that and for the sake of the dollar, I had a friend up in Detroit, Michigan, he and our Charlie Harbin were good friends. Red Nelson and Red married a Tennessee girl. He's, I think, uh, Canadian, I believe. Anyway, Red, where he worked, and he was, he was over a good many men. He had to work seven days a week because of production and etc. And so, uh, you know what Red did? He said, well, if I have to work on the Lord's Day, I'm going to give that money. To the cause of Christ, and he gave that money to his in his Christmas mission offering, hundreds of dollars. Now God will bless a man like that. God will fill a man like that full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, and He'll use that man for the glory of God. He would not touch that money. He would not take it because he had to work on the Lord's day. He said, "I'll give it to the Lord and help preach the gospel somewhere." Isn't that being fair with the Lord? Isn't that being? Isn't that? Like it ought to be. Young man, sit down there, will you please? That's it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mother and a father allowed to take children out, but no one else walking around. Now there's another thing, please, in the Word of God, chapter 24, and verses 33 through 34. I want to give this to you. He met with them, and he talked with them, and as they drew nigh to the village, whither they went, he made as though he would have gone further, and they constrained him, saying, Abide with us. Now get this. For it is toward evening, and the day is far spent, and he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and brake and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us when he talked with us by the way, 
And while he opened to us the scriptures, they returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together, and there they that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and hath appeared unto Simon. In spite of man's weaknesses and man's unbelief and man's doubts and his fears, our God remains faithful. I think if I can get anything over to this crowd today, it ought to be this one thought. When we see people failing us on every hand, and I wouldn't be surprised by what I'm not talking to some of you and your companions failed you. Or you were disappointed in your mother and daddy. Some of you might have had a drunkard for a mother. Your father maybe ran off and left the family. You let bitterness come in. and Your life hasn't been, it hasn't been too pleasant. I met a lady the other day, and you know what she indicated? That she hates men. You know why? Because her father was a drunkard, ran off and left her mother with some little children, and he ran off with another woman. And that young woman or that lady never has, she never has survived that. And she's let bitterness come in, and it's robbed her of the joy of the Lord. And I, I didn't criticize her for that. My heart went out in sympathy, because no doubt as a little girl, she looked upon her father first with love, and then when she saw him abuse her mother and leave the family cupboard bare and run off and take the salary and buy that which pleased only him. It's enough to make a young woman embittered toward everybody and even toward her own father. And of course, you can take this thing clear on through. You can take every facet of life. And it, uh, there are people here involved in such. But you know, friend, even to preachers, I have people tell me, well, I want church and I joined that church, and I did this and I did that. And when the preacher ran off one of the deacon's wives, I haven't been back to church since. Well, now let me help you. The day that you get your faith in man, and only in man, and you do not lift your faith above man, and above these things that are temporal, you're going to fall. I thank God through the years that I've been able to maintain a faith in the true and living God, and He has never failed me. I don't think he'll ever fail anyone. I believe he'll be with us. You know, on my broadcast, and I'd like to give you this. I referred the other day and asked you to pray for our brother and Mrs. Jimmy Allen of the Community Baptist Church in Garden City, Michigan. Their, their son, 15-year-old boy, they found dead in bed just a few days ago. And incidentally, I had one of the sweetest letters from brother Jimmy Allen when I returned home this weekend. He expressed his appreciation. We sent an, an offering uh, to Tim's uh, mission fund. Timmy had promised to give $5 a week to missions in their Christmas mission offering. And Jimmy tells me that over $1,100 has already come in in memory of that young chap. But somewhere way down in North Carolina, I can't remember, I just remember a lady came and said, would you please give this to the pastor and his wife who lost their son. I'd like to read this poem to you by A.M. Overton. I think it's expresses so beautifully the thing I'm talking about. It's entitled, He Maketh No Mistake. My father's way may twist and turn. My heart may throb and ache. But in my soul, I'm glad I know. He maketh no mistake. My cherished plans may go astray. My hopes may fade away. But still I'll trust my Lord to lead, for He doth know the way. Though night be dark and it may seem the day will never break, I'll pin my faith, my all in Him, because He maketh no mistake. There's so much now I cannot see, my eyesight's far too dim. But come what may, I'll simply trust and leave the future all to Him. For by and by the mist will lift, and plain it all He'll make through all the way, though dark to me, he maketh no mistake. I'm going to send that little poem to Jimmy and June because their God never makes a mistake. And when he reaches down and takes that little baby daughter or that teenage son, or you kiss your mother goodbye and you say, well, it's, everything's gone. I don't have anything to live for. Remember, Jesus still lives. And now, Chandra, on the other side of this world in the hereafter, he'll make it all right. And he'll make it all plain to us, and we'll understand. And like the song poets say, we'll say, well done, well done. 
God help you to see that in Jesus Christ you can put your faith and your trust and your hope and your belief and let everything around you go to pieces. You will still have the Lord to lean upon. Could we stand please for prayer?